and welcome to our computer class today. My name is Betsy Sandgren, and I coordinate programs here with Chisago Lakes Community Education for Older Adults. Thanks for being here today in our first in the series of computer classes for older adults in our community. This class is being held at the Wildcat Community Center here, but also being live streamed to the Taylor's Falls City Hall and to Empower Wellness Center in Chisago City. We'll have some free labs set up um, to follow up with these, from these classes, and they'll be offered at all three sites as well. So you can drop in and get technology um, assistance through these free labs. And um, all of the dates are listed on this flyer, so please grab one on your way out so you'll know where to go and how to um, attend the labs. Um, the classes and the labs are all made po possible by a Blandon Foundation grant that was um, received through the Chisago Lakes Chamber and also through Chisago Lakes Community Education. And now to get going on our class, I'd like to introduce two people partnering with Chisago Lakes Community Education today, and that is Jack Dedke. He is the cable coordinator in our community and um, for our local cable channel. And Matt Sonnenteg is our instructor today. He is owner of Bitworks in um, Taylor's Falls and also Forest Lake, so we thank him for that. And one more thank you, we have volunteers um, that are helping us. MJ Saviano is here at the Wildcat Community Center. We have Taylor Givings at the Taylor's Falls City Hall and Sheila Bray at the Empower Wellness Center. So thanks everyone for helping out. All right. Okay. And uh, it's my first time being live streamed as well. So I've heard the camera adds 10 pounds. I'm hoping it adds a little hair. <laughs> so. Welcome to Community Ed Tech 101. Uh, choosing a device. So I know that a lot of you might have specific questions about things that you own already and everything else. But today what I'm going to do is try to take you from ground zero and we're going we're to move forward from there. So you might have some specific questions you want to ask later uh, and we'll kind of get through that if we can. Um, but for today, choosing a device or computing device is, uh, for a lot of you, this will mean purchasing a computer, a desktop computer, or it'll mean uh, uh, buying a tablet or a smartphone or something like that. Um, but we're going to go over the basics of talking to guys like me and purchasing something. Um, so with that, I'm... I'm, I'm Matt Sun and Tag. I own the Bitworks. We're in Taylor's Falls and Forest Lake. We do business support uh, throughout the uh, eastern Minnesota, western Wisconsin area uh, from our shops in Taylor's Falls and Forest Lake. We also do residential and business computer support. And so that means if you need help with your computer, you can bring it on in and see us. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. We also do repairs on computers, tablets, smartphones. Uh, as well as wireless networks and all kinds of stuff that are out there. Um, I've been in the business for about 30 plus years. Uh, I got my degree in management information systems at the UW-Eau Claire. And back then, management information systems was a blend of how to use filing systems and study systems like that and carrying around these big stacks of cards that we used to do programming. So... Um, uh, my, during my career, I've worked at a number of places before I started the Bitworks. I worked at Lockheed Space Operations where we did ground processing for the space shuttle. I worked at Piper Jaffray Corporation where we had a 72 office network throughout the United States. And I also worked for Deluxe helping design some of their eFunds network that you'll see out there running today. Um, in 1999, I started the Bitworks. Uh, and then, then in 2005, I went full-time into that business, and we've been expanding ever since. We're now at eight employees, and we have two locations. We're hoping to add a third. Um, so, Matt, does this mean uh, you know what you're talking about? Uh, I'm trying to demonstrate that, but maybe not. We'll see. I, don't, I see the looks out here, so we'll see. Um, now, um, 
I'm probably not going to talk about all of the things you've heard about or all of the jargon that you've heard. If I'm not doing that, it probably is not important to your purchase decision um, if that's what you're doing or choosing a computer. As we go through this, you can feel free to ask me for some definitions of things you've heard about or that sort of thing, as long as it's kind of on topic. Other than that, we'll, uh, we'll kind of wait through the end, and then you can sort of throw stuff at me. And some of it, I promise you, will not be complete bull, but <laughs> some of it will be. Um, and uh, for any questions outside of that, I'm going to put you in touch with a really good computer guy. So, but, um, so let's move forward here. And the plan today is to want to teach you some basic geek speak. So I'm going to give you some history. Um, and then, uh, and that's going to allow you to not only purchase a computer, but also purchase services on the internet. So things like uh, internet service. Um, there are lots of different providers out there now. We have Frontier, we have CenturyLink, Midco, CenturyNet Spectrum, Starlink is another one that's coming soon. Uh, you're going to see all of those things happening. And to be able to intelligently talk to those folks, you really need to know some of the language. Um, and I'm going to do my best to connect that to things you know. So uh, we'll talk about some of the devices that you can purchase. Uh, and I was originally just going to go willy-nilly into that, but I thought I'm just going to gloss over everybody's eyes if I start talking about megabytes without telling you what a megabyte is. So... Um, and then we'll talk about uh, you know, some of the factors that you need to, to think about when you're buying something and then some questions to ask. So, um, so with that, let's go ahead and talk about the most... Uh, well, so I'm going to teach you to speak like me, first of all. So we're going to go over some bits and bytes, the metric system, RPMs, which basically means the same things that it does in a car. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit about size and speed when it comes to computer and then all of the basic computer parts. And then I have a few more terms in here that we're going to go over as well. So, um, bits. This is the most basic measurement in computing, is a bit. Uh, and if you, I guess the easiest way to think about this is think of it as a one or a zero, an on or an off. So when we talk about, or you hear somebody talk about, or the Spectrum commercial, that's a good one, uh, or, the, or whoever it is known on television these days, they talk about megabits per second. We're talking about one of those things, and it's the most basic measurement in computing. It's either on or off, and all of those wires and stuff like that, they all carry bits. That's, how, that's what's going through there, little pulses of electrical energy. So uh, in all of the geek speak, the bit is represented by a small b. So when you see measurements out there, if it says k and then a small b, it means it's a bit. So um, now, um, having a company called the Bitworks, I've had a number of calls over the years for different things. <laughs> uh, more, more than one drill bit and more than one horse bit. <laughs> so. Um, so, you know, one of the, so that's, that's something we kind of have steered people away from, and we hope that now they're, they're thinking computer bits when they're talking to us. But um, uh, one thing that, uh, that we're going to talk about next is the byte. And the byte is eight bits combined. So when we have the letter A, it is represented as this. this these are the bits. So 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And that's, uh, if it's electrical, it's like minus 5 volts, plus 5 volts, something like that, when it goes through the computer. Um, so there are a number of different combinations of these. In order to make up what we see as the alphabet, there are 256 characters or combinations this can come up with. So when we talk about bytes, they are eight times bigger than bits. That's one, the one thing I want you to take away from this is that a byte is bigger than a bit. Um, and so when we talk about, uh, in computer speak, that's always represented by a big B. So now maybe if I open eight stores of the Bitworks, I'll just change the name to the Byteworks, because I'll, I'll have a byte then. So, 
uh, when we talk about uh, megabits, we are talking about uh, one bit with six zeros behind it. So we're talking about like a million, which is equivalent to a million. When we talk about gigabits, we're equivalent to a billion. Um, and then we go to terabits and petabits and all kinds of stuff that we could go to. Uh, and it just represents more. But know that um, uh, when we do that, uh, that the big B talks about bytes and the small b bits. So, so when you see an ad out there for the latest cable internet system, they are generally talking about bits. So bytes is usually something that talks about size or storage capacity, and bits is something to do with speed. So, um, so big trucks and little trucks, same, same sort of deal. So, um, the things that you're going to see out there when you're buying stuff are megabits, megabytes, gigabytes, gigabits, and terabytes. Uh, those are kind of the, the measurements that we use now. I would not doubt that in 10 years, we'll be hearing about petabytes and all this other stuff when it comes to computers, because people just want bigger and better stuff all the time. Uh, storage in a computer is usually about density uh, uh, and how much stuff we can put on whatever you're storing it on, whether that's on your phone, or um, we can talk about what was on one of the original IBM hard drives. This is 10 megabytes. That's the equivalent of two pictures on your smartphone. And we operated on this for many, 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 many years. So this is a 10 megabyte drive. Um, uh, and so th that's a fairly low density thing. And over the years, they've actually increased that quite a bit. But just know that whatever you're storing on there, it's, it's, we're really storing ones and zeros. It's all we're storing on there. So if you look at it, that's what you'd see. Um, um, so the two improvements that they've made on that over the years are one, packing it in better. So that it's you know printing the Bible on a head of a pin sort of deal. Or, how fast can I pull it back off and put it on? Um, now, we're going to talk a little bit about RPMs in storage. So, I, you know, RPMs, most of us will re remember uh, a record, an album, 33 RPMs, that sort of thing. Um, these drives, or these disks, and this is a little more modern one, than, uh, and this is the inside, they use platters, just like a record album used to do. And they spin, but these things spin at 7,000 RPMs. So they go really fast. And then there's a needle right here that actually moves back and forth on the, on the disk to read the information off of it. Now, these disks or drives are actually going away. They're still available in some computers, and they're generally now a lot cheaper storage um, than some of the, the newer things that are coming out. And uh, what we're coming out with now are called SSDs or solid state drives. And so I'm going to grab one of those as well. Uh, a solid state drive looks like this. It's very light. There's no moving parts. In fact, this is the inside part. And it holds as much as that one does. So uh, the nice thing about these is they use less electricity. And then they also. Um, uh, are very lightweight, um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about those in a few minutes. But um, And now the other thing that we talk about in respect to speed is network speed and packets. And you'll, you'll see this on the, uh, uh, the cable commercials for the cable internet and everything else, and the Frontier guy will talk about this. And um, the one thing that you need to know is that all of this information is in a packet. These packets have been around since day one of internet transmission. And they've always been 1,536 bytes, or 12,288 bits, or thereabouts. Um, the, uh, uh, this is what they transmitted over the internet 20 years ago, and this is what they, or 10 years ago, or 12, or, uh, and this is what they transmit over it today. The difference is, 
And the big difference it is, the speed, in respect to speed, is not how much, how fast it goes through the pipe, because it's always been the same speed, it's how much you can shove in it and take out of it at the same time. So when we talk about 100 megabit networks, they go much, much faster than an old dial-up modem. They're just able to take so much more stuff in and out of that. So that's what speed's about. So it's not, not about the, the Model A and the, or the Model T and the, and the latest uh, uh, car that you see here, but, um, but it's about how much you can pass over that or stuff over that at one time. So, and those speeds are getting faster all of the time. So now with that, what I want to do is, is kind of launch into uh, processors and what uh, those things are. And the, so one of the things that you'll have as a decision, decision factor when you're buying a computer is what processor to go with. Um, all of our desktop computers, uh, for the most part, use one of two types of processors. They either come from Intel or AMD. Um, there, um, there are lots of other manufacturers out there, and they make processors for telephones, for your iPads and your tablets. Um, some of those folks are Qualcomm, Texas Instruments. Remember them, the calculator, way back when? Um, uh, there are other ones, newer ones coming out, and you'll see these in the next few years. One's called ARM, A-R-M. I can't tell you what that stands for, but I'll make something up if you really want me to. Um, uh, Zaoxin, which is, a, which is a Chinese processor, and so these, and then Elbrus, which is a Russian processor. So these these are companies that are that are now launching in these countries that are trying to take some of the market share. So they'll be running PC software and all that other good stuff. So the tendency will be probably over time for the, some of this stuff to come down in price. So hopefully. <laughs> uh, at any one point in time, each one of these manufacturers will have about 100 different processor models out there. So, and they change them out pretty regularly. Uh, most of these are, um, Intel is a Texas-based company. AMD, I believe, is based in California. They're likely made overseas in Vietnam, Southeast, Southeast, Southeast Asia, usually. Uh, there may be a few plants around the United States, but they make just portions and pieces of the processor, and then they assemble them. And I can show you a processor. I've got one. I've got one right here. And Jack can zoom in on that uh, <laughs> if he wants to. Um, very tiny, very small. It used to be on the older computers you could reclaim these, and they had little little pegs in the bottom and that were made of gold. Um, my, my scrap dealer tells me that's not even worth thinking about doing anymore. So, um, but um, now when you talk about a processor and what it does, a processor is what you manipulate your information with. So when you turn on uh, your computer, it reads information from the disk, and that information then has to be interpreted by something, and that's what this processor does. Um, and so the way I like to have people think about it is a toolbox. Uh, these are the cheaper processors, more expensive ones, latest, newest ones. So you, you think about the toolbox, you can get just about any job done with just a few tools. It makes it a lot easier if you got some of these tools, especially if you're building a house or something like that. But uh, for the most part, um, uh, the, the, the tools are, are, are part of what, um, this toolbox is what makes your computer faster or more capable of doing more stuff. So uh, for those people that are just using the internet or maybe doing a little Facebook stuff or a, a little word processing document, um, this, uh, this Pentium processor or this i3 processor, probably a perfect fit for you. Uh, if you're doing a little bit more stuff with pictures, maybe manipulating them in such a way as to put them all, kind of grouping them all together, maybe look at an i7 or a uh, Ryzen. Um, the Athlon, the Ryzen, and, and the, the Threadripper, that's a really cool sounding name one, um, those are made by AMD, and the Intel ones are all i3 
7i3, that sort of thing. When we look at this on a, uh, in a description, it'll also have another number that's behind it. Uh, so it'll say i3-1011. Uh, and that, what that tells us is, is it's the 10th generation of that. So right now we're, uh, this processor in fact is a second generation processor. It's probably 12 years old at this point in time. So it's, it's, it's well past its prime because this is, now I'd buy one that's a 10th generation processor. And most of your reputable computer dealers, uh, retailers will have 9th and 10th generation stuff out there. If you're buying stuff on the used market through uh, Craigslist or Facebook or something like that, be careful of that and you might need somebody with some tech background to come in and help you make sure you're making a good decision because it's real easy to, to hear from somebody, oh yeah, you're buying an i7 processor, but if it's an i7 processor that's 12 years old, you're probably not getting that great of a deal. So, um, um, the biggest thing when it comes to processors, the biggest enemy of processors is heat. And so what we do in a desktop machine is we put something on called a heat sink. And that looks like this. And that dissipates the heat. Now for those of you with laptops and tablets sitting out here, uh, you'll know that this cannot possibly fit inside of that thing. So what we've, they've done on a lot of the laptops and those things is they've slowed this processor down right here considerably so it doesn't generate as much heat. So that makes the computer a little slower as well. So, um, and that's the, the one thing, uh, laptops are always a little bit slower on some of this processing than the desktops are. So, um, so next on the list here is storage, and that's where your files are permanently stored in your computer. Uh, and that's, you'll see that as either a hard drive, and it'll be a hard drive that either looks like this, or it'll look like this, with the cover pieces all assembled. Um, uh, that hard, uh, so the, the more desirable thing right now is to have an SSD or a solid state drive. It's lighter, it's faster, it will uh, transfer information much faster. Uh, and this is where your information will stay when you turn the computer off. Um, bigger isn't necessarily better when it comes to these things. We see people come into our repair shop all of the time that have just a, a big, huge storage space and they've used just a small percentage of it. And they, yet over the years they've used up all that electricity, spinning those disks around and everything else, uh, and they don't really need to do that. The one thing I would say is if you want to store a lot of pictures on your tablet or on your phone or anything else, get bit more storage space, bigger hard drives, those sorts of things. Uh, that's the one, one thing that takes up lots and lots of space. Um, and um, we can put a lot of, lot of stuff on one picture um, or on one, one hard drive, but uh, I guess think of it as a file cabinet and in this case, the uh, uh, one, one megabyte can store, or four, it takes four megabytes to store the average picture. In one gigabyte, you can put about 590 pictures out there. In one terabyte, you can put 250,000 pictures out there. So they, they kind of go up very exponentially. So uh, the next thing I'll talk about here is memory. And memory in a computer these days looks like this. Uh, and we buy these little sticks and uh, plug them in. And uh, the more you have, the better it is, the faster it goes. It, it, this is where the computer temporarily stores information when you're working on something. So if you've got a document that's stored on your hard drive and you turn on your computer, your processor will fire up. It loads information from that hard drive into this memory and it's very close to the processor so it's very quick in accessing it and then it moves stuff in and out of this memory. The more memory you have, uh, the more you can load up. So for example, uh, uh, most people will be very happy with four gigabytes or eight gigabytes of memory and that's a relatively low cost computer. Um, 
If you're like me and you have 15 different things open, including your email and my internet browser, and something's playing music, and I don't know where that's coming from, but um, uh, uh, you want lots of that memory. So, um, so um, the uh, uh, so if we're working on uh, something and the, the power goes out, for example, if you're in the middle of working on the document, that'll be in this short-term memory. And if the power suddenly goes, boom, whatever you're working on is gone. So um, we want to avoid that if all possible. So um, uh, we try to save stuff frequently. So um, you can also think of memory in this way. The more memory I have, the bigger desk I have. So I can put more files out there, I can have more things open, more projects I'm working on. When you don't have very much memory, you can only work on one or two things. So um, that's one way of thinking about it. So it's just a smaller desk space. Uh, some other useful techie stuff. Um, uh, because you're gonna hear about all of this stuff if you're buying something. Wi-Fi is, uh, uh, computer network that runs on radio waves um, and it typically is on what you would all I'm sure all of your tablets and cell phones here probably have Wi-Fi built into them it typically works from 1 to 300 feet um, from from wherever the source is so you have to be within 300 feet of your internet router or something like that um, Commercial Wi-Fi installations, which we also do uh, some of, um, are typically mounted up on, we'll typically mount those on a very high pole, there'll be an antenna, and we can shoot that Wi-Fi signal about 25 miles. So, and we oftentimes put these in uh, larger manufacturing plants or out in, we've done a lot of farms where we have a farmer that's working out in the field and his tractor connects back to internet, so. Um, uh, Wi-Fi will be, you'll use Wi-Fi to connect to other computers on your network, and you also use it to connect up printers um, and other sorts of things like that. Bluetooth is also a radio network, and you'll hear about that on your phone and your, your computer. Bluetooth communicates about 30 feet away. So, for example, this little thing that I've been flipping the slides with, Bluetooth. So, just, just really short, short term. You can also get microphones, headphones, keyboards, all of that sort of stuff works with Bluetooth. Um, and uh, there's, there's always more coming out all the time. One of the things about networking is uh, your fastest and most reliable network will always be a wire. And the typical network wire um, looks like this. Um, two ends on it, they come in a variety of lengths. The limit on this though is about 300 feet without putting some other device in the middle of it. So, so that's about as far as we can move it. Um, but that's usually more than enough to handle most homes and a lot of most businesses as well. So um, a firewall, and you will probably get one of these from your internet service provider. It'll be built into your modem. So if you uh, have any kind of service that's coming from Midco or uh, Frontier, uh, they will come with a modem router that is also has a firewall built in. That is designed to protect you, the person behind the firewall. It does not protect Joe down the street, who you're sending your email from. He should also have a firewall. Um, the, one, the one thing that we always worry about in networks is somebody corrupting that information out on the internet, being able to capture it and play it back. Uh, interesting story, way back when, worked for Deluxe Corporation, when they used to make ATMs, and we, we figured out a way that we could capture this information with our little geeky network tool, play it back to the ATM and made it could spit out a $100 bill. It was really fun. <laughs> our boss kind of went ballistic when he saw us do it. He said, really, you can do that? Uh, and so they fixed that pretty quick. But uh, that was a long, long time ago. So peripherals. Now, and I'm going to talk about these a little bit more when we get into the desktop computers, but peripherals are anything you attach to a computer, a mouse, a keyboard, um, a monitor is a peripheral. Other wireless devices can be called peripherals, uh, but there are things that attach to the computer and expand its function. So a printer is a peripheral, uh, all of that sort of stuff. So 
operating systems generally come with your computer. Uh, so the most popular one you've probably heard about is from Microsoft. It's the Windows operating system. Um, uh, then we also have the Apple operating system and then an Android operating system and then Linux. Um, Microsoft has three or four versions right now of Windows 10. There's a home version, a pro version, enterprise version. Um, all of those do slightly different things. For most of you, the home version will work. However, if you own a business and you want me to hook this computer to that computer, buy the pro version because that's the version that allows you to do that inner networking stuff with uh, some file servers and stuff like that. Um, the uh, two big manufacturers here are Microsoft and Apple. They've been around for a lot of years. Uh, Android was actually developed by a little small company whose people all got rich when they got purchased by Google. And that was a number of years ago. So Google is actually in control of the Android operating system that you see on your smartphones. So like even, this, even your T-Mobile phones your, and everything else. Um, uh, the Apple or iOS operating system is on Apple phones, of course. So um, both Android and iOS are based on Linux. So really, if you get deep down under the hood, you see this Linux operating system. Um, the Linux operating system is really only for the geeky neighborhood kid, <laughs> you know, the neighborhood kid. Um, uh, so that's been around for a long time, uh, but I would say leave it to them. Um, it's, it's really nice because it's free, it's cheap. You, you, I mean, you just download it and put it on a computer, but it is a little harder to use, and it does not work a lot of times the way that you, you would expect it to. Um, uh, the nice thing about Microsoft and Apple is they support those operating systems and they have people there that, that help you out all of the time. So, um, And then most people find it, it really helpful if they can stay with the same operating system on all of their devices. So if you have, um, you have a tablet with an Android on it, a phone with Android on it, probably it's going to work out best for you because you'll be able to just intuitively pick that up. Um, uh, so what's out there for, for computing? Um, lots of stuff. Um, desktop computers, laptops, tablets, smartphones. Some of these things are kind of blending over and one becomes the other and they, they really don't fall into any particular category. Uh, and then we have some specialty devices that some people will use for computing as well. Um, actually, and so I'm going to talk about some of the manufacturers here and those specialty devices are things like Google Nest, the Facebook portal, Alexa. Um, and so some of you will probably already have some of those things as well. Um, and uh, they, some of them drive you crazy, like ours does. <laughs> um, so let's go to desktop computers. Um, uh, desktop computers are kind of kind of driven and made by the what I call the big, big three or big four here. Um, Hewlett Packard, Lenovo, uh, Dell Computers, and then Apple. They're the big manufacturers out there. There are a lot of other manufacturers that make this stuff. Um, Hewlett Packard kind of had its history uh, and has been around forever and ever because they actually sold a lot of medical equipment. So they were in hospitals for many, many years before they started making computers. Lenovo, if you go back, the original, remember IBM invented the IBM computer way back when? Well, Lenovo is the Chinese company that bought the IBM computer. So they're very com good computers. If you still buy a desktop or a, a laptop from IBM, they will sell you a Lenovo is what they sell you. Um, they're well invested in that company. And Dell is the computer company that won what they call the Clone Wars because way back when they said this is all going to be, we're going to let anybody build a computer. And Dell was kind of the one that was able to de deliver the most stuff for people. So, um, um, and there, there's like a million different types of computers out here. We see um, Jack had one in here last week we were trying to live stream with, highly specialized, very expensive, but it's a computer just the same. Um, we've uh, worked on computers that people use for their lathes and their alignment racks and for building ammunition and all kinds of stuff. Um, and um, 
Uh, really what's different on the more expensive stuff versus the cheaper stuff is engineering. It's how well it's put together. and um, We've seen uh, computers that run great until there's a blue moon on a Tuesday and it's, it's like, why is this happening? And it's because of the engineering. Something did not, somebody did not research the parts and components when they went together and they built something that just was incompatible in certain situations. So, um, price range on desktop computers, you can generally get these from about $400 to well over 10,000. You can really spend a lot of money there. Uh, refurbished ones, 250 or so to $1,000. Um, 800 is a, dollars is a typical pretty good price for a desktop computer. Um, one of the things that people like about desktop computers and uh, um, um, uh, is that, uh, um, that you can get the most power, power for the dollar out of these things. Um, dollar for dollar, you're going to get the most bang for the buck out of a desktop computer. Um, one of the things you can also do is mix and match peripherals. So you can buy a bigger monitor. Big, huge screen, size of a TV set if you want to. And if your eyesight continues to fail, you can get an even bigger one. Or you can get a nicer keyboard, a uh, nicer mouse. Um, you can add in these little uh, things, that sort of stuff to them as well. Um, and they're just easy to upgrade. There's usually just a cover that pops off, we plug in a little card, and away you go. Uh, very quick, very easy. Um, the uh, other nice thing about a desktop computer is it's pretty secure. You're not taking it anywhere. It's in your house. Uh, one of the biggest things we see in terms of security problems are people who take their tablets and they leave it in the car and they forget to lock the car and all of a sudden the tablet's gone or the phone's gone or the laptop's gone. Um, and then we have a problem. So we're trying to recover information or what's on that laptop. So um, downside is they get pretty heavy and you they don't run on batteries, so we have to have dedicated power and all that other stuff. And a lot of times they need to have a, one of these wires in the house to run. But that's changing. You can always add in a card to, for it to do that, that sort of stuff. So uh, laptops, we have pretty much the same manufacturers here, the same usual suspects. So we see HP, Dell, Lenovo. They all make these laptops. Um, there is a strong remanufactured, refurbished market out there. So typically what a larger company will do is they will buy newer equipment so that they keep their people more productive. They will lease that for two and three years and then it comes back onto the market. And most of the time those computers that they purchase are in the one to two or two to three thousand dollar range usually. And we see them come back onto the market and we're able to sell them for under a thousand dollars. So a lot of times a remanufactured or refurbished computer is a really good deal if you're if you're doing the doing your first purchase, especially in a laptop. Um, so we have a, a remanufactured computer is something that's gone back to the factory. So it's gone back to Dell, it's gone back to Apple, and they've gone through it and they've fixed it if there was a problem. And then they sell it uh, usually a little cheaper than new. So, um, but it has to be a certain, certain um, vintage for that to happen. So uh, you will always spend more money on a laptop uh, uh, they're harder to make, they're a little harder to work on. Uh, there's kind of a sweet spot in terms of screen size, 14 inches or 15 inches screen size are kind of the middle of the road and those are the cheapest of the laptops. If you get a smaller laptop, it's going to be more expensive. If you get a bigger laptop, it's going to be more expensive. They're going to add more money onto it. I got a question on the refurbished stuff. When you refurbish them, do you put usually better parts in uh, than the Because I know a lot of new stuff, I mean, everybody's looking for cheap, from cheaper price, and therefore they're putting, pretty, you know, not very good quality stuff and yes. stuff stuff. Where when you refurbish it, I mean, your reputation is kind of like, like yeah, hey, I'm going to Exactly. So the question was, when we get refurbished equipment and do we upgrade those? And yes, we do. Uh, I know that uh, we, we actually offer our customers the option, and I know that a lot of other shops offer the same option as well. We buy all of our refurbished computers through a larger distributor, and so 
first thing we do when we get those things in is we turn them on and we inspect them to make sure there's no dents and bangs and, and things are act they've actually done something with them. Because I have bought and purchased refurbished computers before that nobody has looked at. I can tell you they weren't even, they were put on a pallet somewhere and then shipped back out in a box. Um, and those go right back to the vendor <laughs> if that happens and they hear about it from me. But many times we will upgrade these hard drives because a lot of them have the slower drives in them. We'll do that. We make sure that things are working. Um, uh, if somebody's looking for something that's a little more robust than what we've ordered, we can take out components and add in, for example, better video processing, that sort of thing, to a desktop computer. So yeah, we, we do that. Uh, we don't want you walking, you know, I certainly don't want you walking away from my business displeased. We usually want people to be happy, and I think most of the other shops around here want people to be happier as well. So, Back to our laptops, uh, you can spend anything, anywhere from four fifty to 5000 on a new laptop. You're probably going to spend 300 to 1500 on a refurbished one. I say this now because we're kind of changing over in this refurbished market as well. Uh, Windows 11 is coming out in just a few weeks, October 5th. And that's going to require a little newer computer in order to run. And so one of the things we're doing now on the, on the refurbished side is we are purchasing newer computers. We, won't, we let some of the old stuff, we just let it go off to recycling. We don't purchase it anymore. So, and those cost us a little more to, to handle. So, um, so when we get to these desktops, pros and cons, almost as much power as a desktop. But if your grandchild comes to you and says, Grandma or Grandpa, I want a gaming laptop, know that there's a lot of zeros in that price behind there because you've got to get it faster and you've got to buy something more robust. And you're probably not going to be buying from any of the big manufacturers anyway in that case. So those are highly specialized machines. So the desktop gaming computers are usually desktops. So. Um, Laptops, easy to move around. We can do some upgrades to them. We can add more memory. We can replace hard drives. Um, we, uh, we can replace screens and all that other stuff on them. Um, pro and con is that it runs on a battery. And batteries, it's really nice to have it running on a battery and running around your house and everything else. But when that battery dies, it can be very frustrating for people. Um, they are all Wi-Fi enabled, so that you almost always have a network wherever you're at. Um, the uh, uh, one con is the, the smaller screen sizes, especially when you get older. I know for myself, it's a little harder to see some of that small print on those small screens. Um, and you're usually stuck with a lot of the components that it comes with. So you can't replace that screen ever. Can't make it any bigger. We can sometimes plug one of these bigger monitors into it. Um, and they typically are a little bit slower than a desktop. So not my, it never, it's never been my favorite in terms of may, being really productive in, in my computer work. Uh, I've always been, uh, if I wanted to be productive there, I went to a desktop machine. So laptops are super handy, though. I have one right back here running our presentation today. But uh, kind of our next step is tablets. And this is where we start to see the manufacturers change out there. Um, we have... Uh, up in the top here, we have a Microsoft Surface, Apple iPad, uh, and now down here we have what we call the droids, or what I call the droids, um, uh, which are all the Android operating system tablets, and you can buy it. There's a ton of these out there on the market. Uh, the Microsoft Surface, of course, uses a Microsoft Windows operating system, so it's really easy to go from a laptop running Microsoft to a Surface. And in fact, we see lots of these come in, and they've got little uh, little tablets uh, attached to them, uh, or little keyboards attached to them that you can type on, so it's just like a little laptop PC. Uh, very tiny, though. Um, they have a different sort of architecture than some of the machines do. Uh, their memory and storage is really combined in a way, uh, and so uh, they're using the same, uh, same chips to store and process as well. So. Uh, or a lot of the, and a lot of those are built into the processor. Um, so there's no more i3s and i7s and Intel's kind of out of this market. Uh, really, see the people you see in this market are Samsung, Motorola, 
Microsoft has their products in there. See some tablets from Dell, but those are usually relicensed Microsoft Surface devices. So they're licensing that design from Microsoft and building their own tablet. Pros and cons of a tablet, very late. They're made to run unattached. You can be here working on your document and on the internet and everything else. Um, they, it's, they, that's one of the really nice things. Most of them use the same applications as a phone rather than a, than a desktop. So you, you'll see uh, uh, you can run Microsoft Excel on a phone. It is different, though. It is not the same application that I'm running on my PC. Uh, they're diff they're, they're, it's a completely different program. Uh, and the same is true of a tablet. If I run the tablet version, it's the same version I see on my phone. Um, you can't really upgrade them without probably some significant expense and some risk. Uh, you can buy peripherals for them. Um, when a tablet breaks, it's expensive to repair. Um, uh, a lot of people toss these when they break, but we do replace batteries and screens, and, and most of your computer dealers can do that sort of stuff. Um, sometimes it's way easier to buy a broken one, or to uh, buy a new working one than it is to fix a broken one. Now, the, the issue comes in with these tablets and phones is what do you have on them? I mean, this, this phone could cost me $25, but if it's got the last pictures of my mom on it and it dies, I'll pay you thousands to get that off. So just keep that in mind when, when you're buying stuff um, is that the data is what's becoming important to people. So things like backup and stuff like that will matter to you as you're moving forward. And that's what we always caution people when you're buying these tablets and the phones and even the laptops and the desktops is back up that information. It's very important to do that. So uh, finally, smartphones. Um, uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of these out here. They support Windows and iOS operating systems as well and then the Android operating system. Uh, smartphones are a little different because they were really originally developed to communicate with people. So the calling function was there, the communication function is there. The running an application to do something productive is kind of an add-on feature that, that's been added over the years. So, um, uh, but for some people, this is all you really need or all you really want. If you really just want to log in and check my bank balance and communicate with the kids on Facebook and uh, that sort of thing, smartphone will work perfect for that. Um, so uh, pros and cons, uh, it's, they work on cell phone networks as well as Wi-Fi. So I don't have to have a Wi-Fi network around. Um, very small, very easy to carry. They run the same apps as a tablet so that if you do want to move to something bigger, you can uh, use that as a reader or whatever. Um, uh, they are ready source of support from just about any teenager. <laughs> <So> <laughs> and they're more than happy to help you usually. Um, but just, it doesn't run applications like a computer. Repair cost is typically pretty high. Uh, and uh, uh, technology in those things changes pretty quickly. And the other thing is they're also very easily lost or stolen or dropped in a lake. That's what happened on the last one of mine. Um, it's at the bottom of Lake Wapagasset. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully someday I'll be able to get that back, but it's down there pretty deep. Uh, things we pay attention to when you're buying these are the amount of storage that it has and then the camera. Those are the big things that differentiate these smartphones. Um, and I, I don't have one that's, that I particularly like, and I'm not going to force that on you uh, either. So, but uh, um, lots of options out here when it comes to smartphones, but they do change quickly. Um, when we talk about specialty devices, I just... I wanted to mention these because I know that for at least some of my older relatives, this is their computing device. This is what they use to communicate and they do a lot of their stuff with. Um, uh, the Alexa family product line up here, uh, Google Nest down here, and then, then we have this Facebook portal, which is really probably shouldn't be on here, but, but I mean, if all you're doing is doing Facebook, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, uh, Alexa uh, and uh, Facebook, they, they all, all of these things require an account or, or an internet to be able to work.
but they are very handy when it comes to having a, a personal assistant to play music, uh, communicate, you can make calls on them. You can call 911 with uh, these things. So, but they do have limited other functions, and those functions are usually called skills rather than apps. So you'll add a skill to your Alexa. Um, Alexa is probably the most open of all of them. Um, uh, Google, Google Nest tends to communicate with other Google products better than anything else. But the Alexa will you know, talk to my third, my Honeywell thermostat and turn it up and down. And, and you can have it in your car, you can have it at home, you can have it wherever it is. Um, uh, most of them are Wi-Fi enabled and Bluetooth enabled, so they can do all of that. They can communicate with all those things. The, the screens on the Alexa are fairly small. Um, most of the time you have to have some sort of online account and a phone, uh, and they can't be upgraded. They just get obsolete and we recycle those. Now a lot of people are concerned always about privacy with these, and I'm, I'm no exception. I mean, uh, they do, uh, uh, I think, listen to you, <laughs> so in spite of what people say, um, uh, in spite of what the manufacturer says. Um, uh, I followed a guy home from Forest Lake yes, day before yesterday. And I followed him all the way home because somebody in front of him was a little slower. And he was pulling a wood miser sawmill behind his truck. And he pulled up the same gas station that I pulled up at. And we were together. And I was chatting with him. And he just purchased this from somebody on Facebook. You just purchased that. Next morning, I go home and I'm looking at my Facebook, and what do I see? Ads for wood miser <laughs> sawmills. So, and and so it's really amazing at just how much information they can collect, just based on your proximity and where you were at. So it's really easy to figure that stuff out. And the, these companies spend a lot of money doing that. Um, Alexa certainly and Google are both designed to help you shop. That's the number one thing you can do on both of those things. It's amazing that they'll let you buy stuff, but they can't bring up my Menards list when I walk into Menards. So, <laughs> yeah, is, even the phones are that way. Yeah, phones uh, are that way as well. So. Also, and laptops, because that, you know. Um, laptops a little less because you can turn some of that stuff on and off. off but, and stuff too, yeah. But, 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 but certainly have, phones and a lot of these specialty devices the uh, do have microphones on them. There's really not a way to turn them on and off. Um, uh, 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 one of the things that I would encourage people to do if you have the chance is watch the film Social Dilemma if you've not seen that before, before you get into the Facebook stuff. So uh, it, it's kind of scary, but at the same time, you know what you're walking into when you open that stuff up. So let's figure out what's right for you guys. So the, the things that I ask people to do is look at your lifestyle, your needs and abilities, uh, what price, what do you want to spend, uh, your warranty, and then how are you going to get help and assistance. Those are kind of the big five things that I ask people to look at. If your lifestyle is not traveling, you're at home all the time, buy a desktop computer. Uh, it's, it's something where you can go to and you it's secure and it'll be there for you and it'll run, uh, run well. You can also buy a laptop and then you can take it in and piddle around with it while you're on television as well. But um, uh, if you're not traveling, a desktop will be your best bang for the buck. Um, if you're traveling and you move around a lot, smartphone, tablets, laptops. Uh, tablets are really nice to travel with. You can use those as readers as well. So if you're a book reader, they, re make, they, have, they do wonderful at uh, uh, presenting that information. Um, um, if you have a hard time seeing, which I know as, as I get older, I, it seems like every year I'm new glasses and a bigger monitor. Um, you know, that, 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 I mean, sometimes these, these phones can get pretty small and they're hard to see and hard to, to look at. But you can contact our tech, technical staff and they'll help you with some of that. Uh, and if you tell them, you know, this is hard to see for me now. And we can adjust the fonts and make things a little bigger for you. Um, 
So may I, may I interject, sir? You may interject. You can plug a monitor into a phone. So yeah. You oh, yeah. Have a huge monitor with just your phone. Yeah. Yeah. It goes into this little port right down the bottom. You can do that. Not something I'm going to teach people how to do today. No. <laughs> but it's a possibility. It is a possibility. Uh, when it comes to warranties, most manufacturers will give you a one-year warranty with your equipment when you buy it. Refurbished machines are typically 30 days. You can always buy another warranty, uh, an add-on warranty for most of these. The manufacturers will add those in. If you're buying a refurbished device, you can use a company called, uh, one, one company I know of is called Square Trade, and you can go out and buy an extended warranty through Square Trade. The way Square Trade works is if your, your phone dies, they'll say, well, that phone is worth $135 right now. They send you a check, and you just go out and buy it. Um, they won't go through the process of recovering your pictures that are on that phone, though. Um, so the other thing to consider is help and assistance and how you learn stuff. I talked to somebody with the WOW device here earlier today. So they have a good help system, very... Uh, re reactive to you. Other computer manufacturers, for example, Dell or Hewlett Packard, will have you call an 800 number, and you're generally calling a call center somewhere on the other side of the world. Um, sometimes that person's a little hard to understand. Um, we do that with people's computers when they're under warranty. We will actually call in, and sometimes we can get past those people and actually get the part shipped to us. Uh, but many times the manufacturer will, uh, you have to walk through a script with whoever is helping you if, if there's a component that's failed. And many times they can help you figure that out. They are not always real sensitive to keeping your information on your computer and sometimes will give you instructions on how to reset it and wipes out everything you have. And we don't always like people to do that. So um, that's when you come to me and then we're in lots of trouble. Uh, so, um, and we, we, we really work hard to help people out with that. Um, but the one thing, uh, so uh, when we, I've got a list here that's coming up. And um, so these are the questions to ask. Uh, and I did, I'm going to encourage you all, take this with you if you're going computer shopping or phone shopping. Um, or any kind of shopping for technology. This is what I like to do. Well, how can this device help me do that? Um, um, when I need help in setting this thing up, because they don't work right away when you take them out of the box, you know, who's going to help me with that? Uh, how will my data or information be backed up? And more importantly, if you're moving from one to another, how are you going to transfer that information? And um, we do that when we sell computers to people. There's an extra charge for that, obviously. I have a technician that works on that. but. Um, uh, how, who does and how does the warranty support work? That's an important thing to know if it does, things do go bad. Um, and then, uh, you know, what does this reseller, whoever you're buying this from, who's, what do they provide to you? So, um, you know, we always throw in a little extra support and help for people if they buy something through us. We want to make sure that they're happy and that they're moving right along. Uh, and I have staff there that, that do that, and that's their job. So, um, so now we're going to go into a little bit of scary stuff. Um, and I wanted to talk about some of these terms because they're, the stuff's out there. Um, when you get a computer from a manufacturer, um, you will probably get, well, certainly if you've got a Microsoft-based computer, it comes with an antivirus system. Um, viruses are, you know, and I'm going to talk about some of these scary things really quickly, viruses are designed to destroy the function of your computer. It won't, just won't work anymore after you've gotten one. Uh, or it works very badly. Um, and then I'm going to talk about all these, I want to talk about all these wares. Bloatware. Bloatware is, are, is sample software that comes with your computer. It, it comes pre-installed on the computer. If you buy a computer from any of the big box resellers, retailers, so we're talking the Sam's Club, the Costco's, the Walmart's, uh, the Target's. It will be full of this stuff. And the reason being is that you're buying that computer for three, four, five hundred dollars $500. And these companies, that this bloatware companies, all these sample programs, are subsidizing that computer so you can buy it. 
you will probably get one free month of this stuff and then it will slow down your computer uh, or expire and you need to purchase it. So they are counting on getting a subscription out of you and those subscriptions tend to go on for years and years and years after people subscribe. Uh, the rest of this stuff is all the scary stuff that's out there on the internet now. Adware, designed to send you advertisements. You get pop-ups on your computer and all that good stuff. Spyware, designed to watch you, see what you're doing, see what you're up to. There's also the spy networks, which I was just talking about uh, with the sawmill. Um, uh, malware, uh, that's designed to actually compromise and control your machine many of the times. So it will, it will add itself into programs and be able to watch you and, and there will even be people who are able to take over and control your machine with that. Um, scareware is uh, probably one of the bigger things that, that, oop, um, that we see out here. Um, and that's when uh, you're, you're tooling along on the internet and boom, up pops the screen, your computer is infected, call this number, da 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 da. And the first thing they do is they want your credit card number and usually they're very helpful and it's, uh, we see two or three of these a week in each one of our shops. So uh, many times people are, um, are taken by these, um, uh, these, these scams. Um, the other thing that we'll see are just calls out of the blue. It's called the tech support scam. People will call you, say, we're from Microsoft, we're from XYZ company, we're from uh, Facebook, we're from Cisco, or uh, whoever, and you have a virus on your computer. Well, I can tell you this, that all of these computer manufacturers, none of them have time to call you and they won't call you. They're, even if you're calling them, they're really hard to get a hold of. <laughs> so uh, uh, nobody will call you and tell you this sort of stuff um, that, that you've got a virus. I mean, that, that's not a reputable uh, situation and if people are calling you, they are generally trying to, it's, it's a work into a scam. And we see those all of the time. Um, finally, the last thing that's floating around out there, uh, Probably less of a concern to you, although it's a minor, it is a concern, but uh, it's ransomware, and that's designed to hold you hostage. So what they do is they encrypt all your pictures, you can't see them, encrypt all your documents, you can't see those, uh, until you provide a key, and they usually want X number of dollars to, in order to get that key. So um, uh, really scary when people, it's never good uh, when to buy a Bitcoin because you, you have to take your picture and you're holding your driver's license in one hand and you're here and then your credit card in the other and they want that picture in order to buy the Bitcoin in order to pay these people because Bitcoin's not traceable. Um, so it's, it's a hard process to do. So we have people that have done it and sometimes they get their information back, sometimes they don't. So um, uh, we generally advise people not to pay those ransoms when they come up. Um, and to just wait, because many times these people will be caught, sometimes it's two, three, four, five years down the road, but we can unencrypt that information once they're caught, because they, they, will, they will be caught and then, then um, um, taken care of. So, so that leads me to the slide to talk about what everyone needs. <laughs> uh, security, some sort of security software. True security is not free. You can't download something over the internet and expect it to work that's free. Um, almost all of the manufacturers out there do offer you free trials that will work for one month or a few days and then they stop working or you have to manually run them again and people forget to do that. Um, most of these security systems, a good, good antivirus system is going to uh, run you from $50 to $100 per year. Good security systems are available from Norton, McAfee, ESET, AVG, WebRoot. Um, but even with those systems, the weakest point in the security system of your computer is the one sitting in the chair. Just so you know, that's, that's the person that gets suckered in every time. Even me, it's happened. So, um, and then you, you, you Say, okay, I want to turn this off because I really need this software to fix this thing and then all of a sudden I've got something that I need to get 
restored. So, um, backup. Another, uh, another thing that everybody needs. Uh, a decent cloud backup system is about 50 or $60 a year. Uh, there are a lot of manufacturers out there. We have a plan for people. Uh, you can also go online and get Carbonite. It's a Barracuda plan, iDrive. All of these things you sign up for, you put a little piece of software in your computer and it transfers it every night and just backs it up into the cloud. Um, phones and tablets, for the most part, are backed up into either uh, Apple's iCloud or Google's, or on Google Drive or OneDrive or something like that. Um, sometimes you have to pay those companies a little bit more to get a little more space if you've got a million pictures, but um, uh, well worth keeping these backup systems in place. Um, this makes life so much easier for us and for you and everything else. So, um, And finally, run the security updates. Um, this is, uh, a lot of people are afraid to run these. Uh, some, you know, in the past, um, one of the worst things Microsoft ever did was kind of originally release all of these patches to their computers because they routinely come out broke. In fact, my one of my first jobs was testing these patches to, before we actually applied them to our corporate computers and they'd, they'd not work half of the time and, and they'd cause things to break. Um, that has changed significantly. If you're concerned about it, I would say wait a week or two weeks until something has come out. If there is a problem with it, the manufacturer will pull it back. But um, um, I've seen very few that break computers um, now uh, coming out of Microsoft or Apple or anything else. So run those security patches. Those are, those are things that keep, plug the holes. So, um, and so that's kind of where I'm going to leave you all today. Um, I've got some helpful links up here. Um, we can kind of kind of go through really quick. There is there are some. Uh, these are all videos out on YouTube where this recording is going to be. Um, guide to Windows 10. Three and a half hours of instruction on how to use Windows 10. Um, the first five minutes is kind of boring. The rest of it's pretty good. The uh, next guide here is this 40-minute guide to Windows. Windows as well. It's really good. Good introduction. It'll teach you how to use those sorts of things. Um, there are guides available for some of these other systems as well. So um, um, Mac OS. Uh, some of these are very short. The Android ones are six and seven minutes. Very good. Very good option for learning how to use these devices. And um, I guarantee you, you'll pick up something no matter what your skill level is because these folks train on this all of the time. So well, that's it. I'll open it up for questions if we have any. Do you wear special glasses to block out blue light? You can, uh, and a lot of the newer monitors now are coming out with blue light blockers in them. Uh, but you can get the, the tinting in your glass to block that blue light. There is a, uh, the type of monitor there that it's coming out now that blocks that sort of light is called an IPS monitor. And they're very inexpensive. They're not. Uh, I think it's actually cheaper to buy the monitor than it is to get the tint on the glasses. So. I'm getting a message on my phone that says I'm almost out of memory. Okay. Can I get rid of pictures on yes. some other unit or device and then regain my memory? Yes, you can. You can do that. One of the things that. Uh, so the question was, can you when your phone runs out of memory? Can we do something to regain that memory? And yes, you can. Um, typically, what we want to do is we want to back those pictures up um, from the, the Google cloud or the iPhone cloud, wherever they're stored, uh, and put them on some sort of a, a permanent storage device. And that might be one of these little, little flash drives, you know, these little deals. Um, put them on there, and then we can take them off both the phone and the picture, or a uh, phone and the cloud. The other option is on many of these pictures or in many of the cloud software, you can, you can tell it to delete it from the phone and keep it in the cloud. Okay. And automatically, any picture that I take on my phone goes on my iPad. Yeah, and that, that, yes. that's because it's going up to that iCloud. 
and it syncs. So when you, the phone and the and the tablet are sharing. Because I certainly don't need it on both devices. Yeah. yeah. So. so you have to be careful when deleting those, just to ensure that it stays somewhere where your your storage is, your permanent storage. But you can certainly use one of these things to back those things up. So. But. What I want to know is, like, mine say, says I need to buy storage because it's full with pictures. And so it's not putting anything on my iPad, and that's why? Yeah, and that's why. So uh, if, you're, if you're using the iCloud, I believe, and I, I, I guess I'm not going to say, uh, don't quote me, but I think they offer you five gigabytes of storage for free, and then you need to subscribe to more. Usually it's very... Very small fee to do that on a year-to-year -year basis, but you can keep all of that stuff up there. One thing I would caution you on is make sure, you know, when you're, you're storing all of this stuff in the cloud, make sure you have your passwords written down. I mean, they told you when you work someplace, don't write your password down. I'm going to tell you, write your password down and glue it to your nightstand because at some point in the future, somebody might want those passwords when, you, or when you're not around. And it's good to have them there because those things will kind of fall off the edge of the earth and get destroyed eventually. Um, we've, I just had somebody in a couple of weeks ago that, you know, uh, an elderly relative had passed and, and they wanted to get their pictures and they didn't have the passwords and nobody had passwords. And then it becomes quite a chore to get that information from some of these bigger vendors, because you've got to talk to somebody and explain that situation. It's really one-off for them as well, so. Can you take the pictures out of the iCloud? Yeah, so you can tell it not to sync up to the iCloud with each, each but can picture. I take some off that are on there already? Uh, yes, you should be able to. If you know your password. Yeah, you need to log in and know your password. Be very careful with what you're selecting. I don't know what. That's all I'm going to say. It would be the, um, the guidance I would offer. Do you have to go into your iCloud? Yes, I if you want to delete account. them from the iCloud, you have to do that. Uh, if you want to delete them from just the phone, I think you could tell the phone to delete it here and leave it in the cloud. So. Because I um, get probably a ton of pictures in the cloud because my phone keeps saying I don't have any more space in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you've got a lot of pictures up there. Yeah. So. I have pictures of the backs of people's computers and everything else, so all of those are up in the cloud. But. Yes, sir? Can you comment about the new uh, uh, jump drives or sticks that are being advertised that takes your pictures and organizes them all? Uh, so the question is, can I, can I comment on the jump drives that organize your pictures? Um, that technology is certainly there. It's able to do that sort of thing. Generally, they organize based on a couple of things. They organize based on location and date the pictures are taken. Most of this cloud software that people are talking about where the, everything's uploaded, that also has that functionality built into it. If you have a ton of pictures on an older PC, those little storage devices will, be, will really help in trying to organize that stuff. So they do help. Um, um, uh, so it, it is. It, it's it's a decent little thing to have. So. Do they remove the pictures from your phone? I'm not sure. I'd have to know. Your, see the particular one that you're looking at. Some of them do um, uh, delete them from the computer as well. So, so there are there are uh, specialized jump drives or flash drives. These little drives that yeah. uh, designed generally for computers. They can be plugged into the computer and they will read the pictures that are on your computer. They will then organize them by location where they were taken as well as date they were taken. And they, they don't always get it right, but they try. And then they will they'll copy those pictures onto the drive usually. Um, and then you can take this and plug it into your television or whatever and view them. Yeah, it's a little flash drive, but it has some software built into it oh, to organize it. Okay. Yeah, okay, so, you. and most of those things work pretty good, and that same software is usually built into, uh, Google Cloud has that, I know 
uh, I, the iCloud has that sort of stuff built into it as well. So. But. Even after it goes on that stick, you still have to go physically to lead it off your phone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's. What do we do this for? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to manage this information when you get lots of it. So um, uh, sometimes it's easier. Many times we'll take a phone and we'll actually hook it up to a computer so we can see what's on there and then we strip it off that way and it makes it a lot faster for us. Okay, we don't have a computer. We just have an iPad. And so we can't take, download the pictures off of our phone. Like you said, you can look at them and get rid of them. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you don't have a computer? You just have an iPad and an iPhone. How do you get rid of that stuff? How do you... Well, you should be able to go in through the, with the iPod iPad and control what's in that cloud. Um, that's an internet, so you have to log into the iCloud on the internet, and then you can manage those pictures. You can take them in and out. So, all right, I think, I think we're done. If you have other computer questions, I know some computer guys you can call. So. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Yeah, we are, we're doing another one a month from now from in October on communicating. Uh, the next class is communicating through technology. through technology. So we're going to talk a little bit about email. Texting will be in there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about social media. And then, find, and then, then the, the next class in November will be pretty much all social media stuff. So, um, and in, in the November class, we're probably going to be talking more about um, things like Snapchat, Instagram, and Facebook, because mostly that's all I know how to use. So <laughs> yeah, that's in November. So, and uh, interspersed in all of that stuff, we're going to try to keep you as secure as possible as well. I want to make sure that, that you're all uh, safe out there, because that's... It's probably the number number one problem we see today is people aren't safe. So um. yeah, I guess I just wanted to talk about that really quick. Um, we do want these classes and this series of classes to be participant driven. So please let us know what you need, and then we'll try to you know gear the classes mm -hmm. that way. We are offering the three classes this fall, and then again three more classes like winter spring of next year. Um, if this goes really well, we're just going to try to keep it flowing. Um, but the real sustainable part of this is probably going to be the technology labs. And that's where I think you can come in and learn and ask those questions. We're going to try to have some topics at the labs. So um, our volunteers and different people running the labs here in Taylor's Falls and at Empower We'll have some things to teach you if you don't have any issues that week, um, but also bringing your issues in and asking those questions. Um, you should be able to get individual help that way. So that's kind of the, the whole idea of the program. We're just wanting to um, all of us to learn, you know, how to clean up our computers or how to, um, you know, maneuver Windows 11, you know, so whatever the topics are. So thanks for coming, you guys, and spread the word. We do have our next class October 21st and then November 18th. So thanks. <laughs>